Making pots for me is all about the celebration of eating and drinking. I love the idea that sharing food together around a table, uh, beautiful food made by people that care about the food, um, is something that we should cherish. And if you love your food, eat and drink it from pots that are made by people that also have the same passion as a chef to make beautiful pots that can enrich the food, can enhance the experience of that ceremony of eating and drinking. And that's, I guess that's me in a nutshell. That's, that's what I'm about. So I, I throw all of my pots on a momentum wheel, which was designed by Ivan McMeekin. Ivan made a couple of these wheels back in the 60s that are still going strong today. And I was gifted hand-drawn plans by the family when Ivan sadly uh, passed away. And I've been making these, manufacturing these wheels ever since. Some modifications to the, to the design, but ostensibly it's Ivan's true design. And I spent a couple of years working with the geniuses that are uh, the clay team at, at Pot Clays. And we came up with this, this body, which I love, which is TKJ throwing body. And um, it's a lovely, versatile, all-round hand-building throwing clay. But this is the clay that I'm, I'm using, and I throw with it quite soft. And I throw quite slow, as, as, you, as you'll see. So the pot I'm looking to make is a, a faceted dish, a shallow faceted dish. Centering takes up quite a lot of energy, probably the, the, the most industrious uh, part of the process, uh, particularly on a momentum wheel. And usually I would tell people you don't kick and throw, you do one or the other on the McMeekin wheel. So I'll cone it up. Uh, a couple of times and then I'll just use the palm of my hand to to force the clay down uh, and very gently you can see the wheels going really slowly uh, I'll use the palm of my hand to sort of ease that clay out and to gain the sort of the depth that I want I don't want to go too deep because I want to turn a foot that's going to stand proud at the base so I don't want to go beyond that point but I do want to take it all the way down with the palm of my hand so that I don't have to compress too much and dig down too much with my fingers then I'll widen the body out, I'll open it out, and I'm always thinking about compressing the base. Any wide open form like this, um, you know, you're going to have, you're, it's prone to, to sort of problems in the drying process and the firing process. So compressing the clay, compressing the base ensures that the platelets of clay are, are forced in together so that any surface water that's left in the making process um, it doesn't penetrate the clay, it doesn't get too soggy. I'll then start to sort of switch my focus to the outside of the pot, to the rim, and I'll start to sort of lift the clay. And typically I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift the clay in three, in three lifts. The first one is done with my, with my left hand, and I, it's really my fingers and thumb that do all of the work, and I just lift the clay uh, in, 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 in one movement. And that gives me probably half, the, half or two thirds of the finished height and then I'll go in with my, with my uh, right hand to, for the second lift. And the second lift will look to get the evenness in the wall. I'm looking to get clay out of the base and I'm looking to pull it up through all the way to the rim, making sure that the rim, which I'm going to fold over, is going to have enough weight in it to be able to sustain that, sort of hold it up when I'm pulling the flange over. I do a third lift and the third lift is really to make sure that the finger marks, which have become something that I generate deliberately in my work. Uh, but in this pot, you don't want the finger marks. Certainly, you don't want them on the inside of the pot because that's going to detract from, from the, clean, the clean lines and the finish. So the third lift is all about smoothing those lines out. Before I open out the rim and, and put the flange on the pot, I like to compress the rim as tight as I can, really spending a bit of time compressing the clay. That's really the large part of the throwing done. But because of the form and because I want that flange to lie quite flat, um, I'll, I'll take a gas torch to it and I'll, I'll, I'll give it a bit of a burn. That, that flange is going to sit up as it dries because the rim will dry first and so when it dries it shrinks so the rim will want to sit up and so typically two hours or so after I've taken the pot off the wheel it will go back onto the wheel and I'll sit that flange back down again with the rib. That's really all I'll do for that day. On the second day, I'd come and uh, appraise the bowls again. I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll pop the pot back onto the wheel. And then I, I, I get ready to put the scallops in and to, to facet. And I'll usually start with the scalloping. 
And, and what I'll do here is I'll use a little tool I've got, which is a dentist tool, and I will mark up opposite points. I, I do all of the marking by eye. So I'll mark up opposite points, and then I will bisect those opposite points, and then I will break them in half again. And then I start cutting. And this is, you know, so often I've been told you've got to use the right tool for the job. And this tool that I've got is absolutely the right tool because it twists in my fingers. I can turn the tool uh, as I'm cutting. So I, I'm doing less with my wrists and more with my fingertips as I, as I twist the tool. And it makes it look very easy. And I'll be honest with you, it's not easy, but when you get into a rhythm, you almost don't have to think about what you're doing. And if you think about what you're doing, it usually goes wrong. So best not to think too much and just to crack on and, and use the tool. Once I've done the scallops, um, I will clean them up really nicely with a sponge. And this is the time to do that. Uh, the clay is still soft enough to, to sort of round off. You don't want uh, the straight edge cut marks. You want to sort of round that off as, as best you can. So the next thing I'll do is I'll move on to faceting the pot. And faceting is, is a beautiful rhythmic discipline um, to, to get right. The clay needs to be just at the right stage so that it, so that it, it cuts. You'll know instinctively, it, your, your blade won't judder in the clay. And I mean, like anything in pottery, you've got to try and choose the activity you do when the clay is ready for it. And so I'll facet uh, the inside of the bowl. I, I, I'll do it in one sitting and I'll just go take my time and I'll enjoy the process. The final stage of the process, and this is probably day three, uh, depending on what the weather's doing for you, is to flip the dish over and to turn the base. And so I will tend to do wider pots um, uh, that require sort of uh, real delicate foot, um, foot rings. I'll tend to do them on, uh, on my electric wheel. So I'll um, put a couple of plugs of clay around the, the upturned rim to hold the, the centered pot in, in position. All I'm really doing is I'm determining the, the, the outer edge of the foot ring. I'm marking that up with this turning tool and then I'm cutting down vertically into the clay to expose the foot and then I just clean up that juncture sort of at the bottom of the foot ring. I'll then switch my attention to the inside. So I'll mark the inside of the foot ring and then I'll mark the centre and I'll usually do an extra foot ring in the middle because it's quite a wide dish and they're quite thin these bases, they can slump a little bit. So just by having some little foot ring in the middle of the base, that stops that slumping process. When that's done, it's just apply the mark and then the pot's done. I was being very sincere when I was talking about food and the celebration of eating and drinking. That was, that's, that's really what I'm about, I think. I mean, I make whiskey sippers because I bloody love whiskey.